Welcome to a special bonus episode of The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And today we're excited to be joined by Melissa Morton. Melissa is a codicologist and a cultural historian who studies the material aspects of old books and manuscripts and the people who made and used them. Her research started in Italy, but it's broadened to include the study of global manuscript culture, the spread of book technologies, and book use across Africa, South Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. She combines interdisciplinary methodologies drawn from material book studies, history, art history, and the quantitative sciences, and has been known to make parchment, paper, and to bind books. She's currently a research associate at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and she helped organize the current exhibition at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto called Hidden Stories, Books Along the Silk Roads. Melissa, welcome to the show. Thank you. I am I am a fan of the show, so to be on the show <laughs> is a great privilege and an honor. I'm feeling very very happy. <laughs> oh, oh, good. We're glad to have you here. Eagle-eyed listeners will have noted that uh, it's been a little while since our last episode came yeah. out a few months ago, and that's because... That's my fault. Well, that's because of a number of reasons, but it's because Suzanne has been very busy with a project with Melissa. We've been gestating a exhibition at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. There's sort of a, a long version of this story, but the short version is that the pandemic closed down international loans. And so we worked together with some partners in Southern Ontario to put together a show that was intensely local and also global. So objects and local holdings in the Royal Ontario Museum, the Aga Khan Museum, the Fisher Rare Book and Manuscript Library, and Western University and a private collection. So local, but doing book history all over the world. And Melissa and I have been basically together virtually every day over the last several months. I'm getting ready for that. Yeah, I, it really was a gestation. I mean, I'm thinking about the time it was nine or 10 months, right? Which is a very short amount of time to be putting on an exhibit. But when you're in it, this deep for that intensity. It feels really long, but the baby's been born. So <laughs> yeah, these shows usually, as I understand it, because my first time being involved in co-curating a show, they usually have a couple years, two, three years anyway, in advance, oh, right? Yeah. Yeah. And in some cases even longer. And here the timeline was very compressed because we were working under exceptional circumstances. I mean, in a way, this episode is a little bit like our um, reading and pandemic episodes that we did at different times where we're like, these are weird times. This is the stuff we're doing. Mm -hmm. So the show just opened up uh, about a week ago or so when this episode comes out. You both got to come to Toronto and I got to meet up with you there and see the exhibit. It was a terrific exhibit full of really interesting and fabulous texts. Anybody who's in Toronto should go check it out as soon as possible. But if you're not in Toronto and can't visit, there is a website as well that includes images and details about all of the items in the collection. And it's really worth poking about. Actually, it's worth poking about even if you've been to the physical exhibit, because there's more details to be found there. I think it would be good to start out with just a basic sense for listeners who haven't seen the show yet. What is the show? What is the point of Hidden Stories? So the idea of Hidden Stories, actually, the title anyway, came out a little bit late in the process. What we were after early on was to tell a story about the pre-modern world using books to do it. In other words, using books not in terms of their contents, which is what we usually talk about on the Spouter Inn, right? Stories, texts, tales, nonfiction, fiction, but rather the books as objects. So the materials they're made of, the uh, art that adorns the pages, the unusual scripts, the craft practices that make up the bindings and other kinds of physical substrate of the object, right? So we want to tell a story about the past, but using those to do it uh, together with other objects that might have traveled with books across trade routes by land and by sea. And so putting this together, one of the things we found, and, and this was for me the most exciting part of the whole process, we found that it was possible to kind of make the objects tell their individual stories, but also tell their stories together. So the groupings we started to make when we were doing layout, the threads that kind of ran through the whole exhibition, uh, that, I don't know, I found that super interesting. So those are the hidden stories, right? Each object might have its own story, but there are many, many, many stories embedded in this one exhibition. I don't know. What was your experience? Because you come at this from a very different perspective. Like I come at this project as somebody who, you know, is interested in literary history, you know, interested in other kinds of history as well, but, you know, coming at books mostly in terms of the contents of books. But you're somebody who comes at books as objects. I mean, you're a codicologist, right? Like books are your bread and butter. Yeah. And book forms too. So that was one of the most exciting things about the exhibit was 
we had scrolls, we had manuscripts, we had various book forms, Poti manuscripts from Southeast Asia and Tibet and Nepal, and also objects. I really loved that about the conceptualization of the exhibition, you know, as a space where people would encounter the other material artifacts or objects that lived alongside these books you know, it really does evoke a sense of like, these were the people that use them. You know, there's robes and carpets and jewelry. And that I thought was brilliant. You know, one of the, one of the brilliant strokes of a genius with, with the exhibit. Yeah. And it's always about books, like where books are, like whether the jewelry is holding a little tiny book that you might wear as an amulet, whether it's a a large sort of decorated case that might hold a sort of sacred text up on the wall, um, whether it's a thing that might be a book or might not be a book, um, this beautiful green textile that has the entire Quran written on its surface, right? Is that a book? I mean, it is and it isn't, right? Um, so book, book and books and bookiness are basically what's going on in that exhibit. So as someone who, you know, wasn't involved in the creation of this, but was just seeing it basically fresh when I got there, One of the first striking moments for me was, okay, there was a collection of objects that are used to create books, you know, pens and and, and things like that, and scissors. That's fine. I sort of expected something like that. But there were also, I think, two different book stands. Mm -hmm. And something about these really interesting book stands, which were, one of them was very intricate, one of them was a bit plainer, uh, but they were curious little folding traveling stands. And that something about them just made me suddenly think of these books as items in motion, as objects themselves, rather than ways of transmitting texts as holy relics or as amulets, sort of you know written texts that are meant to protect the people who carry them around. That was all familiar, but really making me think about, no, these are objects, is just having the book stand and thinking about the book that was on it and thinking about the travels it was going through and the trading that was happening along the way. Yeah, it brings to mind the physicality of the object. In other words, would the book be read by just one person reading in a private way, or would it be read in a communal kind of way, right, where people gather around the book stand, either seated or however? And the ones we had on display, one of them was sort of Islamic style, would have been used as a Quran manuscript holder. The other one is from Ethiopia and would be used to hold some other kind of scriptural book in the Christian tradition, right? Psalter or something. Yeah, Psalter probably, right, a book of Psalms. And so thinking about, you know, how do we hold books? How do we treat books? Right. You know, in the, in, you know, 21st century North America, right. I think we tend to be, and I'm like this too, right. Pretty cavalier. Like some of us might write in the margins of our books, like I'll write, but only in pencil, you know, but anyway, you know, we, we, we use our books as tools almost, but there are these traditions that sometimes persist into the present, right. Of treating books in particular kinds of ways, like as having, how can I put it, a spirituality or an aura or something in them. Right. And that's particularly true for scripture, but it's true for other kinds of books as well, maybe. That there's there's something more than just their material. Although let's not pretend like people weren't writing in these books as well. There's you know, they're designed to have margins for you to annotate or put notes in sometimes. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's also the traveling through space, you know, the 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 exhibit of books. I mean, that was one of our themes was uh, you know, books along the Silk Road. So how did these things travel? Not just technologies, but some of the books like the Ethiopian devotional manuscript has its own carrying case. The amulets uh, would have had scrolls in them, and then that form becomes like a style of jewelry, you know, that no longer have scrolls inside of the, the amulet cases, but that takes its own trajectory, you know, in the decorative arts. Like you said, the, the the two book stands that were there, there's a very large textile with the Quran written across it and the chapter headings in these rosettes on the cloth. And you would not know, you wouldn't know that it had text on it until you get up really, really close to it. No, it's so neat when you watch people at the exhibit, right? Because they look at it from a distance and then they get close and they go, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, no, that was one of the most stunning pieces. It's a very large textile do you know the dimensions off off the top of your head? Ten feet, eight feet, maybe eight by four or something. Something like that. That sounds about right. And it has the entirety of the Quran written on it. And I don't know off the top of my head how many words or characters that is, but it's very small print. And of course, handwritten, right? And handwritten and very sort of formally, like all planned out beforehand, of course. You need to know how big your handwriting needs to be before you begin. And and it fills up the 
box of the textile perfectly with like some large uh, rondels or whatever you would call them Rosettes, in the middle. Uh-huh. Rosettes, yes. It's it's an astonishing piece. The dedication to making so much small handwriting is stunning. It's a beautiful piece as well, and a gorgeous shade of green, frankly. (laughs) Yeah, it's only one of a few examples of micro script in that exhibit. And I've been thinking about scripts actually over the last few days. You know, we've got a lot of different kinds of script happening in that exhibition, right? You know, so um, in different languages, so Arabic or Persian or Tibetan or Hebrew or Giz. Pali. Pali, like so many, many, many languages, right? But the scripts also have a tremendous variety. And the micro scripts is they're sometimes called, are a particularly interesting case, right? Because they're super difficult to read. And you got to wonder, well, what is the point here? I mean, is the point to read them? Or is there something else going on there? They have a mnemonic function. Is it the marvel that you're meant to experience? One of them there, uh, one of the objects in the exhibit is um, a Quran scroll written in, again, microscript, but um, on certain parts of the scroll, there's negative space, that is, places where there's no writing, and that negative space itself is spelling out words. Yes. So, right? It's such a marvel, right? It's and so I've been thinking amazing. about that. You know, what, what is that for? What is, what are we, what's being done to us by those scribes? I mean, I think neither that scroll nor the giant textile are intended to be read primarily, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But they are both expressing or maybe even translating. That seems not quite the right word for a number of reasons, but they're somehow making visible, making material the holy and remarkable aspect of the Quran for the, the creators, for this culture. The marvel, yes. It's because their readability is a crucial part of that, right? In other words, they're not primarily there to be read. I agree with you 100%. But the fact that they're readable, the fact that it's all there, the fact that it's this marvel, um, that's that's no mistake. Yeah, no, they are completely readable, and that's very important. Mm-hmm. But that's not what they're there for. They feel like sort of like talismanic objects, like the the green cloth, the 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 scroll, the Quran scroll, but also the, the, the tiraz fragments with the script uh, woven into... The actual fabric. We should explain what tiras are. So they're like ornamental embroidered script, which might be on the sleeve of a garment, the hem of a garment, or um, on the edge of a turban wrapping. Um, and thinking about, you know, what, as you were just saying, what is that writing for? Like, what is it about to have writing on your clothing? And especially to have it, as in the case of um, uh, some of the tiras fragments that we have there, the ones borrowed from the Royal Ontario Museum, to have them be oriented in the way they are, right? So that they would be, as it were, legible from your skin side. It's legible not from how can I put it? Not from outside your clothing, but it's legible from the perspective of your skin within the clothing, you know, as if it were written on the inside. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, right? So you got to ask yourself, what is that for? Because legibility is clearly not even the point there. Mm-hmm. Your body is understood as being part of your sense perception. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like this is completely foreign or alien to our cultural moment. I mean, I'm thinking of tattoos and especially the trend of tattoos in foreign languages, where even the person who has the tattoo can't read it, so to speak, but knows what the secret meaning is that is on on a part of their body that isn't often intended for most people to see. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's the exact same function or the exact same understanding, but like this other use of text is not as foreign to us as it might seem just because we don't usually put things in the hems of our clothing. Although that has been done a few times, like in high fashion and so forth. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the other object that it sort of evokes that talismanic power is the Ethiopian amulet scroll. Sometimes they would be made to the height of the person that uh, was ill or needed special um, healing. And they generally have these three images on them. The archangel is usually the one in this center. And then at the bottom, often they have um, like a portrait of the donor, which is so cool. Because where do we ever get this? You know, where do we get this actually in any manuscript tradition? I mean, you you know about it in sort of European painting and stuff. But um, this particular one is from the, the Fisher Library at the University of Toronto. And at the bottom, there's uh, a, another angel. And then, you know, a portrait of the person that had commissioned it, which was actually a woman. And this is written in Gez, but not in like a standard, like it, it's using the alphabet, but it's, it, there are often things like 
Aob Derillo, who's the curator of Ethiopian manuscripts at the British Library, who's been working with us to contextualize these Ethiopian objects, he was saying, well, I can't, you know, read like the whole thing. And also he probably wouldn't because it it does have a sacred power to it that is only meant to be read by the priest, the Deptera. And so the people that have those um, are not reading them. You know, there's some power in the words of these objects. Um, and it is tailored towards a person. But as he pointed out, and you can see this, the, the whole scroll is actually on the digital exhibit. If you zoom into the very bottom, there's some rubrication. So some script in red, which is the name of the uh, person who's being healed by the scroll. And it's been crossed out and another name's been put in. So it's, it's, it's something that is able to be passed along. You know, is that another family member? Is that you know, someone who's related enough to this person that this particular set of magical, you know, in, incantations like d- make sense. Yeah. It's so interesting, you know, to think about that because, you know, one of the ways we've been talking about that scroll is that it's, it's, it's private as opposed to communal or collective. Like we really distinguished looking at these objects in the show as things that are about gathering a lot of people around them as opposed to objects that are for private reading or private experience. And we've been thinking about this scroll in the latter context, but as you're saying, there is a sense in which, at least within a certain kind of chain of inheritance, um, there's a way for that to be passed on, right? And we were talking about how with these scrolls, they're sometimes even made to the height of the person for whom they were commissioned, right? And so that's very intimate. It's like almost like the book and the body are lined up together in some sense. Absolutely. But that, that, that very relationship can, in a sense, be inherited and can be part of the spiritual benefits for the one who comes after. I think that's so neat. This one's pretty tall. I think it's over six feet tall. So as Aob said, that we, mm. we, we Ethiopians are tall, but not that tall, you know, <laughs> especially for maybe for a woman, but they also are buried with people. So yeah, so connected to the body. And there are a lot of objects like that in the exhibit. It really gives a, a visceral sense of, you know, the lives that these objects have had. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to put it, the lives they've had, because that's one of the things we got very interested in as we were working on this show. You know, if we have an object that's from, let's say, I don't know, the 15th century, right, we want to put it in its historical context, and we want to know everything we can about that, you know, time it was made, the circumstances of its creation, you know, people who used it in that first generation, right? But they've had long lives, many of these objects, right, and been in different places, different collections. Some of them have entered into collections as a result of colonial kinds of conquest and things like that right and so thinking about those layered stories those layers of history that these objects have that's something we want to keep thinking about and in particular in the digital exhibit we want to keep adding those parts of the stories um, as well you know to recognize that it's not just like this connection between our present moment and this one particular moment in the past it's a lot of moments that connect the past and the present and it seemed like a lot of moments that I didn't expect to find, or let's say a lot of people that I didn't expect to find in the places that they were found. So I remember in particular, there's an object that is in Hebrew. I don't remember exactly what the object is, but it was from China. And it turned out that there had been a long history of a Jewish settlement in China. I don't remember where in China. You might know. It's Kai, it's Kaifeng. And so it's a city that had a community of uh, a Jewish community located in it, most likely um, that arrived in the context of trade, probably from Persia at some point. And they were established there for hundreds of years. And so in the 19th century, um, some of those objects were acquired by a, a missionary uh, and bishop who um, later on was back in uh, Toronto, and he brought some of the objects he had collected, and they're now in the Royal Ontario Museum. And he studied them and everything like that. So he was, you know, he was, how can I put it, he wasn't just like some kind of tourist or something. He was really serious about trying to understand that community. But still, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting and odd part of the history of these objects and how they found their way to Toronto. And it also sounded like that community had been there for hundreds and hundreds of years, that there was a temple that had, you know, been destroyed and rebuilt a few times, which is normal enough. And then in the 19th century, that history comes to an end. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know anything about this. This is the first I'd encountered this. And it it was just a fascinating story, but like what the details of the end of that story, I don't know if we know that much about it or, or what. 
Well, actually, we're, that's one of the things we're planning to do over the course of the exhibit. We're going to be doing a kind of a symposium gathering in February because the exhibit comes to an end at the very end of February um, in 2022. And, you know, sometimes when you do an exhibition, you plan it out, uh, you come to the opening date, it opens and like you're done. You brought it to the finish line and you're done now. But this is not the way we've approached this project. We're happy that we've got it to the opening date, but we're continuing to work on it, continuing to build materials around it. And one of the objects that we particularly want to use as a point of reference in February is that leaf you're talking about. It's from a, a, a codex, a, a book as opposed to a scroll containing Genesis. And, um, you know, again, as you said, written in Hebrew characters, but produced in China, right? And thinking about that leaf its history, um, the other objects that also come from Kaifeng that are in the Royal Ontario Museum's collection, um, and placing that in the context of um, Judaica or Jewish history in museums, and also how we represent East Asia, right? And so thinking about how an object, how you can use an object to tell a very complicated story that has a lot of different chapters to it. Yeah, that's fantastic. One of the things that was really strange and kind of wonderful in getting ready for this show was, you know, we were working under very particular conditions. We were had a whole team of collaborators and we were meeting frequently, like several times in the week, um, but we were meeting virtually. So we were doing everything by Zoom and we were gathering images of the objects by Zoom. Some of them we ha- had ourselves not seen in person, though curators had been able to look at them and report on them and share images with us. Um, and then when it came time to do gallery layout, that was also all virtual. It was like having like a dollhouse and the designer and uh, two of us that were curating were kind of saying, oh, should we put it here, put it here, you know, making groupings and so on. Um, and then we finally got to actually see the objects and that was incredibly trippy and weird and amazing. And, and I just wonder what your experience was like, Melissa, like what were your, th- I know how it felt for me doing that, but I mean, what was your experience of like working in that virtual space and then suddenly popping out of it into the real world again? Well, one thing, I mean, I'm really just led by the materiality of objects. So it was very odd to be talking about things and planning, you know, placements of things and thinking about them without having any sense of scale. And it was a surprise when we, in some cases, we saw the actual objects. We're like, wow, that was bigger or smaller than we thought, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, so much bigger <laughs> or so much smaller. Like that very first uh, prayer book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The Del al Yeah. With the digital images are just like these bright, jeweled, stunning things. And you just think, oh, and they're so detailed. You just think this thing's like at least handheld, you know, bigger than your hand (laughs) and you get to it and it's like this tiny little thing. It just doesn't even seem possible. But it's like this gem. It's the most incredible thing, right? It is a gem. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, But I, I think a lot about, you know, the size of things and how it relates to book use. Like the, the Ethiopian scroll was much larger than I had in my mind, you know. But many of the books that we put together are are very similar in size. So the there's two Qurans from ones from India and ones from Ethiopia, and those are in a case together. And that was just stunning to see those. Yeah, like because they're stylistically related, but they're also so distinct, and they're in a kind of conversation, right? Yeah, and the other one was right in a case just next to those. It's the the Toledo. Bible from the Fisher, which you knew about before the exhibit started. It's a Hebrew Bible, so incredibly beautiful calligraphy. And that's right next to uh, a page opening of a Islamic manuscript from China that has really beautiful, like sort of chi- Chinese style calligraphy on it. And you can really see it's it it looks you know from a distance it it has both kind of like Chinese calligraphic feeling to it but it 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 is also evoking a kind of islamic style of calligraphy mm-hmm. and yeah I, I, that that juxtaposition that you're just mentioning is one that was really exciting for me because how can i put it on the face of it you might be like why would you put these two objects together you know one is from iberia right from spain one is from china right one is in jewish tradition one's in islamic tradition one is you know they're they're so different in so many different ways but what they have in common is this incredibly beautiful uh sort of i don't want to say when i say fanciful i mean that in in an exuberant positive way like exuberantly beautiful uh fusion of word and image right it's incredible 
um, writing word art happening on both of those pages. And so when you look at them together, you're like, is it word? Is it image? Which one of those w- worlds are we in? And the two of them are kind of singing in harmony, right? They're, they're doing very different things, but you, you kind of hear it as it were as one song. And I remember when we were planning out the exhibition, we we're putting objects together. I remember being so excited, like, I guess that was one of the first sort of combinations that I got excited about. And then we started making more, but that one was really intoxicating. Um, and I'm happy that it, it, it works. You know, when you see it in person, we got there, we saw it in person. We're like, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, it is good. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's also an interesting pairing because on a very basic level, like these are two separate ends of the supercontinent of Eurasia. And you've got religions that are that originated somewhere in the middle. And you sort of, you, you know, or at least I knew when I saw it that, you know, there are Jews in Spain and I know that there are Muslims in China. Mm-hmm. And yet having them next to each other really makes you think about the entire breadth of the continent and the amount of journeying and communication and trade and whatnot that has gone through the entire unfathomable length of this space. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, that's exactly right. And yet, as you say, there are some shared characteristics between the two. Yeah. And, and, you know, there are other opportunities to make comparable kinds of juxtapositions. Like another one of those that I really love happens early in the exhibit where it's two objects that are uh, the, the oldest dated objects in the whole show. They're both from the 10th century. And one of them is a pair of leaves from a uh, Mishnah or oral Torah manuscript from the Cairo Geniza. And, um, beside it is a print woodblock printed prayer sheet um, that would have been to celebrate a Buddhist festival written uh, in Chinese characters and um, that survives from the library caves at Dunhuang in central China. And so again, this is a really neat kind of juxtaposition, right? Here we have one that's on parchment, the Mishnah leaves, one that's on paper, that's that printed poster, um, one in Hebrew, one in Chinese, one printed, one handwritten, and preserved in two very different locations, like one in Cairo, one in Dunhuang in Central Asia, Um, but also both preserved in this kind of incredibly serendipitous time capsule. So the Geniza was a place that people would put documents that were written, that Hebrew writing on them to avoid the prohibition on throwing away papers that might have the name of God or other kind of sacred writing on them. The Geniza was a place to put documents in a safe way, right? So that's how those Mishnah um, leaves survived. And in the uh, Dunhuang caves, these were sealed up for probably for Uh, because there was some sort of imminent danger at a particular moment in the 10th century. And so normally these are, these are kind of ephemeral, right? These, these kinds of things would not maybe have survived, but because they were in these environments, they survived over a thousand, well over a thousand years. And so that again is a juxtaposition. It's more of a historical one than an aesthetic one, but I think it's also powerful because it gives you the sense of how remarkable and rare it is for these objects to survive, right? And that close call, I find that really I don't know, really moving. Yeah, I feel like those should have a thought bubble over them or something <laughs> like like these are because they're so discreet and they're so like just brown. You know, there's nothing. You know, you're not. It's not one of the shiny objects, as we say, that you're you're just marveling at. But if you get that they are about a thousand years old and they're they have this similar provenance and they come to us because they were put aside you know, in this special way. It, they're very, very powerful. Yeah, I happened to notice that, I mean, I, I, I try to be a diligent museum goer, and I happened to notice that it said paper from over a thousand years ago. And I thought, what? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how much paper we have. Like, I, I, you know, when I was doing medieval studies in grad school, it was European stuff and paper really, you know, we have some paper from, I've touched paper from later, a few hundred years after that, but this seemed unfathomably early for it. I don't know how much early, early paper has survived. I don't know what the earliest surviving paper is. That's an interesting Yeah, I don't question. know what the, er- yeah. We have a sort of documentary, um, you know, references to it. And there's a lot of mythology around paper, how paper comes mm. I bet to, to the West, um, most of which is not accurate, but great stories of battles and paper makers and, <laughs> you know, being taken prisoner and then they steal the paper technology. And, um, that one's repeated, you know, even was repeated to me at the exhibit, which I thought oh. was, 
this wow it's like oh this is and i did you know i didn't say anything i just thought okay well that's the thing these stories have legs right like it's not always how can i put it factual accuracy is important like truthful stories are important right but the stories that are how can i put it more fanciful that are doing other kinds of work they're interesting too right they tell you something else about what's at stake in that claim for example Well, one of the things I was really hoping to have a chance to ask you about, Melissa, is um, how you came to be interested in the study of books as objects. And I know we've been working really closely together for the, like ages now, and I have literally never asked you this question. So how did you get to love books? Well, I'm from the Midwest, and I was studying art history at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, where I did my undergrad. And I was like an art student, so I was taking art classes and art history classes. And uh, I took a, a a book class. It was a photo book class. Um, and the teacher was a photographer, but had no like experience what really in bookbinding. And so none of the books ended up being bound. And it was very funny. So like mine ended up being like an accordion, you know. Um, and I became so fascinated with bookbinding that I went and studied in New York at the women's studio workshop and ended up living there for a, a while and learning bookbinding. Learning to make the actual bindings. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And so I became a bookbinder. I came at this through like being a practitioner. Uh, see, I knew you knew how to do that, but I didn't realize that came first. That's so cool. Yeah, it came first. And then I decided to go to Italy and study art history because I had lived there as an undergrad and studied art history and uh, became very interested in the production of books there. So, you know, kind of comparing my interest in history with my practical knowledge of materials and binding structures and stuff. And so, yeah, it's the, the two of those coming together equals codecology and <laughs> material book studies. So that's so cool. And you must, t- one of the things that I ended up, I, I could never have worked on, but I ended up really loving in the exhibition was this kind of mini exhibit within the exhibit. That is this low case that has an assortment of book bindings, um, that is bindings that have been removed from the books that they originally encased that, that you worked on together with a couple of our other collaborators. What was it like working on that? That must've been like a dollhouse for you. It really was. I mean, again, seeing it in person, uh, these book, some are, some are covers, some are the inner covers, the doublures of the Islamic books. Some are full manuscripts, a few of them, and they are all really different sizes. They're really stunning. And it was, it was fun to work with, with Felice on this and also Patricia Bentley, who's the interpretive planner for the exhibit and thinking about how do we, you know, explain technologies? How do we, you know, in that case, it is really, you know, the takeaway is, is meant to be that Islamic book technologies and book decoration really heavily influenced, you know, European book decoration in the 15th and 16th century. And it there, I think it's a great kind of um, parallel to what the exhibit is really meant to do as well, that the Silk Roads aren't stuck in time. You know, they're so often depicted as just like a certain period of time in a certain geographic range. And I think we're kind of blowing that apart. We have objects from a thousand year history, right? Yeah, a thousand year history, but also from Japan all the way to Mexico, right? We're sort of breaking outside the box and really thinking about, wait a second, what do we all have around us today? And that was influenced by this intercultural trade and, and, uh, exchange of ideas and, um, it's everywhere, you know? So I hope that's, that's a takeaway from the exhibit, uh, with the people that visit. Yeah. No, I like the way you're mentioning how expansive the show is geographically, you know, like Japan to Mexico, right? That, um, you know, we talk about the Silk Roads, we're talking about very particular trade routes, right? And we already extended that concept a bit to take in not just land, overland routes, but also sea routes. That is thinking about the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, you know, the Red Sea and so on, thinking about circulation in a very broad sense. And then we allowed ourselves to push a little bit further and to think about where these book technologies go, like what the the maximum extent is. And one of the objects we ended up working on took us in a very unexpected direction. I'm thinking about the baptismal registry from Mexico City. We were originally interested in that, like, because of the book format, right? Um, that was something I know you were quite interested in, right? And you were working on. What kind of binding is it? 
It's a, I mean, it's considered an archival binding. So it's something that you would find in archives. It's an envelope flap, right? Which is sometimes associated with typical Islamic book technologies, craft practices, but then you find across the Mediterranean, like you were saying, especially in commercial or archival settings, right? Right. And I I would see, I would, I would say that, and I do say that (laughs) the Islamic flap, I don't know if people are familiar with that. It's one of the typologies of Islamic binding is where you have this flap that comes up over the cover, like an envelope flap that comes up over the foredge and the cover. There's that type of binding that we get from the Islamic tradition. And then European, these kind of envelope flaps that you see on archival bindings, that usually have sort of floppy covers. You know, they're not hardbound books. They're made of leather like this one or parchment often, paper later on. Um, and that envelope flap is just, it's a, it's something that can expand like your three ring binder or, you know, the more stuff you add into it, the, the covers just expand because it's got a flexible spine and then that flap can just kind of flap over. Those two types, the European archival type of the Middle Ages and, and beyond, and the Islamic typology, both have a common ancestor in Coptic binding because the very earliest books that come down to us from the third century, um, and we know there's evidence in the second century CE, they have those flaps. Hmm. So they both kind of, they, they're they they're cousins, right? They're distant cousins. Yeah. So originally we thought we would be interested in that book just because of the kind of, the, because of that flap, because of the way in which the binding was made. But then once we were looking at it more closely, we kind of couldn't look away. We became more and more aware that we had to think seriously about the contents of it. Chris, you saw that baptismal registry, which we have right there as the very last object in the show. What did you make of it? It was a very striking piece to end the show with. First off, because, as you say, it really pushes the boundary of what can be included. And it's, you know, even further flung, so to speak, from the rest of the objects. It also is, of course, a striking thing because it is a baptismal register happening in Mexico City. And it is recording names and baptism dates of indigenous children. And that's a really striking thing to read about, especially in Canada in 2021. Um, I, I mean, not just for 2021, uh, but certainly it's been on a lot of people's minds lately about the effects of conversion and colonialization on Indigenous children. So it's a very moving thing. And also to have that be included in an exhibit that's about trade so to speak, really underlines that, you know, trade, sometimes trade is great. Sometimes trade is, you know, I need something and you have something and we can both benefit from it. And sometimes it's not great. And and there are some real uh, awful stories hiding behind examples of trade. And I don't know if there were that many of those kinds of terrible stories being told throughout the rest of the exhibit, even though some of them must have really underlain some of these objects. So it resonated in all sorts of different ways. We started to hint at that just a tiny bit, actually, just before the point in the show we're talking about now, that is with the Alexander the Great section that we kind of started bringing out a little bit, you know, conquest, exploration, but also there's a really dark side here. So we just started opening the door to that a little bit. And then, but you're right, though, with the baptismal registry, that's that's a different space. I'm going to describe it a little bit. So what it is, is a register, as you were mentioning, of births. It lists the name of the child, the priest who's performing the baptism, the names of the parents, where those were known, the names of the godparents. Um, where the parents are named, it'll mention their neighborhood, you know, what, what particular neighborhood in Mexico City they were in, and the profession of the father, where that's known. There's a lot of bakers, um, interestingly. And um, so it's this strange kind of document that is at once testifying about settler colonialism and the ways in which people were categorized. Their separate registries were kept for different kinds of people, right, who were being sorted out into uh, Indios or indigenous people, uh, people from African descent, people of mixed descent, and people of European descent were all categorized in separate birth records, right? And so it's, it's, a, it's a testimony to that system of racialization and categorization of people. But it also, and this is something I came to be sort of I came to notice more as time went by, there's also like the individual stories of the human beings. In other words, it's a dark story, but it's also a glimpse into these individual lives. Actually, 
I owe that observation to, I, I was talking to a couple of friends who um, are themselves um, deeply concerned with and active in um, reckoning with uh, the impact of residential schools in Ontario. And because I thought, well, maybe we can find some way of talking about this object as part of that conversation. And they both were, they, they saw the differences between these two historical situations more than the similarity, right? Um, but, but, but in both cases, they were pointing out, you know, oh, look at these individual lives. I wonder if there's a way to connect with those communities. I wonder, you know, who's still there. I wonder who, you know, in other words, it wasn't that they weren't seeing the dark settler colonial history here, but they were also seeing this other, these other tiny micro individual histories. And I was really moved by that. And I'm hoping that in the coming months, we might be able to find some ways to, to fold out that part of the story more fully. That is the glimpses into those lives and possibly the, the, the people or the communities that descend from them. I hope we can do that. I think that's a really excellent way of viewing a document like this as not just a record of a grand scale tragedy, but as also a way into at least some fragment of what can be found about these individual people exactly and th that's something the digital exhibit um you know we, we were thinking about ways in which the digital exhibit can do things that the gallery exhibit can't and vice versa um on the digital exhibit that whole manuscript is digitized it's been digitized by the fisher library where it lives and you can you can page through the book on the the digital exhibit, and there's also a conversation there between Suzanne and David Fernandez, who's the librarian who cares for this book. Those types of things are really rich. You know, if somebody wanted to 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 read it, you know, they're not going to be able to get to Toronto to do it, and probably wouldn't even have had time to sit and read the whole thing. But it's something that you can access digitally. The one thing you don't get, you know, on the digital is the the kind of scale of things. And it was really funny, Alexander Balintignanu, who's our digital guru, who designed the Omeka site for the exhibit, when she was first putting up the images, you know, we had fields for, you know, different things like the dimensions and the title and things like that. And then she said, well, how much does it weigh, you know? Mm. And it's like, we've had these conversations. I always have them in special collections and things like that, you know, when I'm teaching and trying to convey the sense of physicality. Um, but that, 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 that's a really interesting thing to think about, you know, what are other ways that we can put these things in a kind of physical context, you know, a hand or a, you know, something to give it scale, to give it, to give it physicality. Those are things that are sort of lost in the digital exhibit. So it does some things really well. And in other things, it just, there's no, there's no substitute for seeing it, you know? There's no substitute for either side of that, really. Like, you can often see things in the digital that you can't see in person or not see as easily, certainly. Yeah, especially with those microscripts and so on that we were talking about before. Um, the detail is so astonishing. You really can't see it with the naked eye. But the digital exhibit and the IIIF um, images, which are really high quality, you, you could you could go in deep, 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 deep into these individual, individual objects. And so, you know, we really... I'm thinking I had almost forgotten, you know, when we were first deciding to do a digital exhibit as a companion, you know... Now we're thinking about it as, you know, the two of them work together hand in hand. But when we first planned it, we were worried. We didn't know what the pandemic situation would be like. And we were like, well, what if everything is closed? What if the digital is the only thing we have? We have to be ready for all the possibilities. And so I had I had kind of wiped that out of my mind until we were just talking today <laughs> that, that we know, but that we really had to think uh, of all the possibilities. Yeah. What What is it going to do? Because we thought at first, well, it can't just be a companion to the in-person exhibit because it might be the only exhibit. So that was Suzanne's brilliant plan B as usual. <laughs> yeah, well, gotta, gotta have plan B, right? But it also gives you a wonderful um, experiential component to the in-person exhibit. So it does some cool things like it does do this sort of companion type augmentation of the, of the experience. There's a QR codes throughout, you know, on key objects, not, not a lot. But one of them is um, the singing from the Antiphoner that is at Western University. It's this giant, giant choir book. <laughs> it's like takes four people to hold it. And, you know, like, I think even if you read music, you can't read it. It's from like the 16th century. And so the notation is different. And to hear these voices, Kate Helson and Shrong Sharma, they're singing the two 
folios that are opened um, in the exhibit is just, it's stunning. It totally, it, like we were saying, it transports you to another space and time immediately. It's so cool. It is a really wonderful experience. And the entire exhibit is wonderful. And congratulations to both of you and to all of your collaborators for managing to put it together under such extreme circumstances and under such a, a short time span. Uh, very well done. How long is the show going to be open? Until the end of February 2022. Excellent. And then the online will continue for a few years. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. And we were thinking about acknowledgments because I think one of the the undercurrents of organizing the exhibit has been, well, how many pe people does it take to put on an exhibit? You know, it takes a the answer the answer is like 150. You wow. know, yeah. like yeah. And you never think of that, and that's yeah. one of the cool things. We're kind of lifting the veils uh, on these stories of these objects, but also the process. You know, the human process, the modern human process of of uncovering these things in a responsible and thorough way. It takes it does take, yeah, a, ma a big village. So kudos to everybody. Well, Melissa, thank you for joining and talking about the process and about the fabulous exhibit. And listeners, we promise there will be regular episodes <laughs> returning fairly soon. <laughs> uh, but until then, listeners, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. Show notes with links for things that we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 48B. And The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time, see you again at the Spouter Inn.